Hello and welcome back to the channel. This is the first in a projected series on astrophotography. If you like this series, please let us know. If it's popular and people like them, I'll keep doing them. Photography's beginnings can be traced back to somewhere around 1824 when it was discovered that a light-sensitive emulsion spread over something flat, usually back then just a piece of wood, and then exposing it into a light-tight enclosure, usually through a pinhole, and then developed a certain way, would yield a reasonable facsimile of what the camera was pointed at. This is commonly considered to be the first photograph ever taken. If you take a class on photography, they will very often show this to you. Now, it isn't very significant either technically or artistically, but it is, of course, very important from an historic standpoint. Now, of course, they didn't report shutter speed or aperture back then, but there are things that you can infer by looking at this picture. For example, look carefully and you can see shadows on both walls. Due to the insensitive emulsions from back then, this suggests a very long shutter speed, perhaps as long as eight hours or more, so if that image looks kind of good to you, you know, it's pretty good for a first image that's ever been taken. It is. This is what the raw image actually looked like. So there's been quite a bit of post-processing going on there. One of the first pictures to ever taken of people was in Paris, perhaps a year or two later. This was taken around 8 or 9 a.m. And there are people moving around Paris, but of course the shutter speeds were so long that they're blurred in the picture and you can't actually see people in one of the busiest cities in the world at the time. But if you look in the lower left-hand corner, there is one exception. Someone is getting his shoes shined. They stood still long enough to capture this image. This has created a debate among photographic scholars. And the question revolves around this. How long does it take to get your shoes shined? Hmm. The problem is any number that you are likely to quote for that length of time is probably not long enough given the photographic emulsion speeds of the time, which only deepens the mystery. What happened here? Did it take longer to get your shoes shined back then? Did the photographer pose them and ask them to stay there longer? I'm not sure anybody's ever gonna know that. Photographs were very expensive and at the time only the very wealthy could afford them. But along came Jacques Monde de Caire, who developed a process that would make things faster and cheaper, and many of these photographs spread, this time mostly on glass, are universally referred to as daguerreotypes. These are the photographs that you see that Matthew Brady made in the Civil War, and these are, of course, very highly prized by collectors today. So the exposures went down from hours to as little as 10 to 15 minutes to produce an entire photograph, and the costs had come down so where the average person could actually afford one of these things. These were spread, again, on glass or on pieces of metal, and they are sometimes collectively referred to as tintypes. Tintypes are studied today in colleges. I worked at a fine arts college for a while, and I was often a guinea pig for people who wanted to demonstrate this sort of thing. So I had to sit still in this backdrop here for a full 16 seconds while almost 5,000 watts worth of light <laughs> shined down on me. This thing was really slow, even by today's standards. I did some back of the napkin math, and I figured the ISO, what we would consider today to be the speed at below one and actually very far below one. So this is the tintype that came out of that and you notice that the image is reversed. Many of the lenses back then were Petsball type designs, that's what we would call them today, and they reversed the image, but of course back then nobody cared, you were just happy to get a photograph. Processing of tintypes is problematic because they use some dangerous chemicals. In this case, one of the developing chemicals was potassium cyanide. So after the photographs were taken, the professor would go into the dark room and lock himself in it, and he would come out later, we're glad he came out, after the chemicals had all been safely disposed of. Modern scientific photography is often traced to 1872 due to a bet between two wealthy men. One of them was a former governor of California, the other was Edward Moybridge, who was studying motion and photography at the time. The bet was, do all four hooves of a horse leave the ground when it's running? At the time, they didn't have stop-action photography, nobody ever knew. And in fact, if you look at paintings of horses taken, uh, made before that time, most of them will show at least one hoof on the ground because the artist just didn't know, wanted to cover their, you know, cover their bases on that one. In doing so, he had to invent a method for taking a scientific series of photographs at fixed intervals, and some of these techniques are still in use today. By the way, look at this photograph, and the answer is 
Yes, all four of the horse's hooves do leave the ground at some point. Look at the top row. It didn't take very long before somebody decided to take this new technology, stick it at the end of a telescope, point it up at the sky, and see what happens. History does not record when the first astrophotographs were taken, but this is probably one of the early ones. There was an eclipse that happened, and this was taken with a 60mm f13.5 refractor, and the exposure was 84 seconds, conveniently about the length of totality for a typical solar eclipse. Astrophotographers back then ran into the same problems that plague imagers today. Astrophotography is the perfect storm of the worst possible situations that you could put a camera through. The light levels are low, and you're point looking at pinpoint objects which are some of the most difficult objects to photograph correctly and without any aberrations. Serious astrophotography is often credited to Henry Draper's work in the 1880s. Using several telescopes, he took over 1,500 images of the moon. And, you know, I'm showing some of these right now. Those don't look too bad, even by today's standards. Now, you'll notice up until this point, the only astrophotographs we have are of the sun and of the moon. This should not come as a surprise. Those are the brightest objects in the sky. But in 1880, Henry Draper did point his telescope at the Orion Nebula. Using an 11-inch Alvin Clark refractor and an exposure of 51 minutes, he got this image, and again, given the technology of the time and the fact that he was completely inventing the thing as he went along, it's not bad. A few years later, in 1883, Andrew Ainsley Commons in London, using a 36-inch reflector, got this image of the Orion Nebula. This was an eye-opener. For the first time, people were seeing things that could not be seen with the naked eye, and there were images that could be shared. This started a revolution all around the world, where people started pointing their telescopes at the night sky and photographing all kinds of objects and generating the atlases that we know today. When I was in college at the University of Illinois in the 1980s, we had a period refractor from about that time. It was a Warner and Swayze 12-inch F15 refractor, and it was a old instrument, wonderful to work with, and very cumbersome as well. But I got this image of the Orion Nebula in 1986. But if I monochrome my image and place it next to Commons's image from almost a hundred years before, you'll notice, other than the fact that mine was in color and the speed had been reduced from 60 minutes down to around eight minutes in my exposure, there really hasn't been a lot of progress done in a hundred years. I remember the 1980s and people were doing things like Kodak came out with a faster film, but it's grainy and it wasn't all that great. People were gas hypering things, people were freezing things, and these were incremental improvements. But by and large, not a whole lot of progress other than speed had been made in almost 100 years. Then, in the late 1990s, everything changed.